Follow Without Warning Podcast Season 3, Investigation Derailed with Sheila Waisaki on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Without Warning Podcast presents Season 3, Investigation Derailed. Come behind the curtain with private investigator Sheila Waisaki and examine a major injustice. Warning, the following episode contains elements that are graphic in nature. Listener discretion is advised. You heard the words confused and confusing a lot last week. These are seasoned true crime podcasters who have researched dozens of cases. Evidence and cold cases are rarely neat and tidy. And because of that, we don't all agree on how to interpret it. We did agree that Katie, River, and Aiden's death needed a closer look than what they've gotten so far. As you listen, remember that as all of my volunteers and private investigators and podcaster friends sift through official documents, photos, and other evidence, there is no file folder with answers to who did it, where they did it, and what weapon they did it with. We often come up with questions we never find answers for. And sometimes we find new evidence that makes us reconsider what we believe happened. A few of the issues that had us all scratching our heads got some answers when a treasure trove of information that had gotten displaced became available to me and my volunteers. This podcast was to take a case and crowdsource it as an experiment. And I brought in Three Men in a Mystery, The Unlovely Truth, Danielle Birch, who is running my forensic group, to talk about the evidence and to talk about what we know. In the middle of the podcast, we got new information that we reviewed a week later, which changed the direction for me. An investigation, a lot of people tend to assume, is simply continuing to gather more information. But at some point, you have to take a step back and analyze what you've got. You have to see how the pieces fit together. If you were doing a jigsaw puzzle, there's only a certain way things are going to go together. And if you've got a piece that you can't quite fit in, you don't take a hammer and force it in. You look for the piece that does fit there and you look for the spot where that first piece really goes. And that takes time and reflection and trying things out this way and that way and and then coming to conclusions once things fit. And so we needed to take a step back and evaluate where things fit and where they didn't. And so we're taking another look, reviewing the evidence. And since we got new evidence in, This episode is all about reviewing what we heard from Three Men in a Mystery and what we are looking at going forward. We want to make sure that what our theories end up being are solid. And so if you've still got some pieces that aren't fitting or you're getting new pieces in, you have to stop and you have to reevaluate. And maybe your theory then moves forward because you've gotten confirmation and maybe it doesn't. Maybe you take a step back and have to go a different direction. Which after last week, when we got more crime scene photos in, a lot of us looked at it and went, could she have been hit by the train? But what we know after reviewing things, she was not killed by that train. I think we all agree on that point. Have we identified which train has actually hit her? Because there is a difference between the freight trains and the Amtraks. But one thing that's kind of consistent is most of them have what most people refer to as a cow catcher mechanism on the front of them. It is essentially like a blade, like the blade of a shovel that is low to the front of the train and it's made to clear objects from the track. I would love to know what train you think hit her. I don't know that there's really any good way to answer that because... We just have so few facts. 
I would imagine that that most trains are equipped with sensors. I would think that that's a safety requirement, and yet nobody looked for any kind of data, any kind of reports that, you know, hey, we had a sensor go off at this time on this date. Nobody looked to find the actual train, again, to look for blood, tissue, anything like that. Um, Measurements were not taken because, you know, science just is what it is. Physics is what it is. If you can say a woman of this weight and a train of this weight traveling at this speed, you know, it reminds me of those junior high math questions that we all hated. You know, train A leaves the station at this time. They give you those problems for a reason because it shows you that you can use math to figure these things out. And so at the very least, investigators should have gathered that data so that if there was ever a question, they could see, look, we can show you with physics how this happened, or we can show you that your theory didn't happen. Why wasn't the data gathered? So several points to that. Um, First of all, in the January 2020 meeting with Dwayne Lewis, the sheriff right now, Kokinda, I don't know if he's Detective Kokinda or just Police Officer Kokinda, I don't know his, his standing. They told Vicki that the train was in a scrapyard. If it's there, then go look at it because, you know, the years have probably obliterated physical evidence, but you can still take measurements. You can still see, is there a cow catcher on it? I mean, it could have been removed, but you can at least make the effort. So 12 years later, you're sitting in a meeting after 48 hours ran, and you tell the mother, oh, that train is in a scrapyard. Why did you not know that 10 years earlier, five years earlier, or even when it happened? And why did you not track it down then? Kokinda was part of the initial investigation. So he was one of the police officers, detective, whatever his standing was then who actually was one of the quote-unquote investigators. Well, that brings up a new question to my mind. So either you knew during the original investigation and you didn't tell anybody, or if you know this years later, it's because you've looked into it. Well, you wouldn't look into it if you didn't think it was important. I just, uh, none of this seems logical to me. I like investigations to proceed in a logical manner because there are some questions that are just common to all investigations. You should always ask things that should always be looked into. And then even though not a lot of investigations I would think involve trains, when they do, you look for the train. Correct about not a lot of investigations or situations surround a train. I have been talking to people that do reenactment, and I always do the conflict of interest. Do you have a conflict of interest? And anytime I've said so far, train, pregnant, train accident, pregnant woman, they're like, you don't even have to go any further. We've never had that. Wow. So just from that standpoint, You think, again, that they would have wanted to gather incredible amounts of data when they could, because if this is that rare, you're going to want to take any opportunity you can to learn from it. John brought up the cow catcher. Because John brought that up, we're looking into it through the investigative lens and see if that is possible or it has something to do with Katie's death. But we're taking it very seriously that he believes that had something to do with her death. Chickens, Diet Coke, reality TV, and murder don't seem like things that should go together, but somehow they do. 
If you're looking for your next binge-worthy podcast and you like your true crime light on the gore, then you should check out our show, Moms and Murder, a true crime podcast hosted by myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Each week, we give our take on a new crime story, balancing our delivery of facts and levity while still giving the stories the respect they deserve and making you feel like you're a part of the conversation. And there are over 100 episodes to binge. Search Moms and Murder on your favorite podcast app and subscribe so you never miss a new episode. I've always wondered if, A, if you want to commit suicide by train, why make it as hard on yourself as it was for Katie, walking so far while you're pregnant, it's cold, you don't have your glasses on, it's night, you're carrying, allegedly carrying your toddler. That seems odd to me. If someone else is involved, you kind of have the same issues. Obviously, they want to get out of sight of third parties. Did they have to go that far to be out of sight? Because if you're carrying someone who is either already dead or they're incapacitated somehow, that's a long way to carry them all by yourself. Maybe you're not all by yourself. Femoral artery was severed and the femur was crushed and broken. How do you guys, what, how do you think that happened? Well, I guess that's what we're doing here. But like the, you know, that does seem like a, a train type injury, the crushing of a, the femur, right? Or a car or something. I mean, it doesn't seem like a, an incision, that part. The biggest problem with this case is you have the appearance of, if, if we're calling it a crime scene, you have the appearance of the crime scene, but you actually don't because the largest object that's part of this story is unidentified. Seems like there's been no forensics performed on. And even if we just simply knew specifically what train it was, we would be able to get someone like Gray can simulate physics and see if this is reasonable that she was thrown in that way. But effectively, it's almost like we're looking at the dump site and we're not looking at the whole crime scene because we're missing the train. Yeah, it seems like they would have easily been able to track down the train and find where the impact was. Did they, did they ever even do that? That's the question. We have the appearance of a crime scene, but we actually don't have a crime scene because we don't have, you know, which train it was, the the reenactment. And the police, here's the thing, Lori, the police may have this information, but why would you not tell Vicki, this is the train, it was an Amtrak train or a CSX train going north or south. So we've heard it was southbound and we've heard it's northbound, that they've changed their minds. Why would you change your mind? Well, hopefully, if you've changed your mind, it's because you were presented with evidence that's more convincing of a different perspective. That is the best reason to ever change your mind. Sometimes people change their minds because, again, that confirmation bias. They have, um, you know, put all their eggs in one basket and then something comes along and doesn't fit. And so they have to change their mind on how they see that piece of new information rather than trying to reevaluate their opinion. In this case, I have changed my mind about location, where it originally happened and the secondary location of the train. I do not think the train killed Katie. Oh, I I agree 100%. The lack of blood is just something that cannot be explained away. Uh, the, The lack of other injuries with such a traumatic um, collision cannot be explained away. Um, Some of the things that witnesses are telling us cannot be explained away. So, you know, when you're faced with that, you have to stop and say, well, then if the train didn't kill her, what, what are these pieces of evidence pointing to instead? And then you start looking for a new theory. I'm so grateful that some investigators have started looking at the case and saying, have I considered, you know, her lining her up here? And what that's why I've made phone calls to reenactment people to find out, you know, would you do this reenactment and show me how she could land 
at this location with these injuries. And so again, coming up with different theories, coming up with different perspective has brought me to, that's not where she died. That's where she was found. Right. And, you know, we've been talking about Katie, but another big piece that doesn't fit is River. It's very hard for me to conceive after you see the pictures of the site that she could have been thrown from her mother's arms, the distance that she was, and have virtually no injuries on her. There's a tree line between where supposedly Katie was hit and where River was found. And if she, it's a thick tree line. And if she traveled through the air that entire way, you would expect at some point that she would have some scratches from tree limbs. She would have some debris that caught in her hair. And you don't see any of that. So how how does that fit with the theory? You have to say, well, it doesn't appear to. And so let's look at other theories. Well, and that theory of her being ejected from Katie came from Rick Olick. And he does have an interest in that theory being correct because it confirms some of his, his other theories. But that's not how you answer these types of questions. You don't use one theory to prove another theory. If the theory by itself doesn't hold, it doesn't hold. So then you can't use it to go propping up other explanations. And if that's your theory, and science doesn't lie, show the mom how it happened. Oh, exactly. Again, I didn't see any documentation measuring where she was found, and I'm speaking of River, versus where Katie was found, versus where they thought the impact was. I I saw nothing about like a a trajectory, a path that they think she would have taken. They don't show how she ended up in the position she was in. They don't explain why she is in different clothing. Uh, There's just a lot of questions that should be easy to answer if your theory is correct. So why would you be afraid to gather that data. And why would you keep it from the mother if it would put all her questions to bed? Oh, exactly. Because it seems to me that the prevailing mood is the mother's hysterical. She can't accept reality. um, She doesn't understand, whatever. Then if you have the answers, if you show them to her, then not only are you going to give her peace like a caring human being would want to do, but you're also going to be able to say, we don't really need to look at things any further because we've shown you exactly how this happened. And they've not done that. Said, to my knowledge, this is what we believed happened. There's a few gaps in in the information we were able to collect but not enough that makes us disbelieve this. They just want her to take them at their word. But they're not reconstructionists. They're not physics professors. They're not someone with the expertise to be able to just eyeball something and declare what they've declared. And if they brought in experts... They need to show the mom how it happened because they can say, oh, well, we brought in, let's say, you know, Billy Bob, somebody who did a reconstruction and we've done our job. No, you haven't. You need to explain to the mom how her her daughter died. And the other thing is you have this case open but not active. Your words that you use, open but not active. Well, and I've, I've heard in other cases where authorities, and, and sometimes I'm sure rightfully so, argue that there are budgetary constraints and experts are expensive. But when you don't even gather the data, 
then even if you were able to get an expert to look at it at a reduced rate, or even if the family was willing to pay for their own expert, you've made it so that that's impossible when you don't gather the data. Hi, we're Eliza, Allison, and Carlin, and we're the hosts of Resolved Mysteries Podcast. Our podcast follows the 80s and 90s television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack. We have a love for true crime and the unsolved. If you don't remember Unsolved Mysteries, we forgive you, but you don't have to know to get into our show. If you like true crime stuff, ghost stuff, alien stuff, or just stories about weird shit like Bigfoot, this is your podcast. The stories we cover range from totally ridiculous to truly heartbreaking. We do detailed research on all of the segments that Unsolved Mysteries aired, then drink some wine and give you the latest updates on every case. We talk about stories that will leave you laughing, crying, and occasionally outraged. Resolve Mysteries podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite pods. Join us and perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. The direction of all the wounds is showing that she was likely hit facing the train, especially if we are assuming that the wound across her abdomen is impact from the train. The head wound, you might say, like if she was facing away from the train. And then when the initial impact happened, she got knocked forward and could have had the head wound happen a different way. But if we are making some assumptions, she's sitting on the tracks or she's in a prayer position on the tracks or something like that, the baby would have had way more damage. And there was practically no damage noted in the autopsy outside of a tiny contusion on the baby's head. Um, And then, of course, to your point, yeah, tree line. But the only way that I think that that could happen is if she was holding the baby facing away from the train, impact happened, and she took most of the force and the baby was ejected. But what we would expect to see there is her back should look significantly different than at least the preview of the images that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, it's it's possible that maybe he was chasing her down near where her car was parked. He hit her with his car, I don't know, and then carried her out there. But that seems kind of like a difficult thing. It could be that he chased her down the tracks and when the train came by, he shoved her against it. That's, that's and then what he, I, he moved her around a little bit after the fact. I well, almost I, get the sense of what Gray's talking about, that maybe she's being held there and pushed out where her body is already, she's already dead and is pushed out in front of the train at the last second. I sort of get that feeling that Gray's well, along those lines. They've never been pregnant, so... Well, that's true. So the three guys talking about uh, a pregnant woman carrying a toddler down a train track have never really carried a toddler pregnant down a street, never mind a train track. And, you know, when you're carrying river, you're not carrying 30 pounds like it's weights. You're carrying 30 pounds of fussing, crying, squirming child. I mean, it's cold. She doesn't have a coat on. She didn't have shoes on. A little bit of precipitation. And if if you're running with her, she's not going to like that. Theories need to be discussed and looked at, but uh-huh. they also need to be ruled out one way or the other. I can't buy the theory that she's being chased. I think she's dead. Or at least unconscious at that point. Well, I think she's dead because where is the... I, I can't That's true. If you're her. unconscious, you'd still be bleeding. Right. I can't... You cannot get around the lack of blood in that location. Mm. There's some new information that came in recently because people are listening to the podcast. People are communicating. What's really interesting is the people in that community don't want anyone to know they're listening to the podcast or writing or, or giving me right. information because they're scared, which yeah. what, when are we going to change the dialogue and not let your average law abiding citizen be scared to speak up? Oh, I agree completely. And, and it's nice when you have a podcast like yours with a tip line, you know, you can give that anonymously. You may think that what information you have couldn't be helpful or they probably already know about it. Oftentimes, that's not the case. Again, there was so little information collected here because conclusions were made very, very quickly with not a lot of evidence or data to support those conclusions, in my opinion, 
but there may be no official record of the information that you know, or it may have gotten buried and overlooked and it needs to be brought to people's attention again. Or you just assume other people knew surely one of them has said something. That's very rarely the case. So if you think you have information, make sure you call. You could change a family's life. You could change the course of, of how this town functions in a good way. So, you know, make sure you turn over any information that you have. And we are getting information. That's why we know some of the things we know or people are speaking up. You know, the place where the cars parked, it's interesting. The baby being found in the water doesn't seem to match. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's just one of these things that's really confusing. It's a confusing scene is what it is, to be honest with you. So the clip of Gray saying it's a confusing scene, it is a confusing scene based on the documentation that the police put forth, not that she was at the train tracks. That's not the confusing part. It's the theory they came up with on how she got there and why she got there. That's what's confusing. Right. And it's, you know, you hear a lot about staged scenes where they try to throw you off of what actually happened. This is almost the inverse of that. They were missing things because they didn't think about them whoever was responsible for this. It's not that the information that we have was put there to misdirect other than her being placed there. But, you know, where could you possibly study how to stage this type of scene? And so it's things that you expect to be there that aren't that make you think, no, wait a minute, this, this isn't right. And investigators have to look at the absence of evidence as well as the presence of evidence. Having Gray, John, and Mike on was a great exercise for me because I know if anybody out there is going to disagree with me, I know Gray and John will. I also know (laughs) they will, as you know, um, they will bring a different perspective. And that is what I like so much is bringing people in that have a different perspective. And the fact that they came back with, this is a confusing scene. And this is not what I expected based on a train accident. They started out, okay, it looks like she was hit by a train. Okay, there's enough. There are many wounds that potentially could be a train accident. But then at the end, when we went through all the pictures and all the little things missing, as you you call it, the absence of things, they were like, this is not what I expect on a train accident. I always like to say that all of us together are smarter than any of us separately. I know that the the be-all and the end-all image of the detective is Sherlock Holmes. And of course, he had his sidekick, Watson, but he was basically always telling Watson what an idiot he was and then going on to solve it all by himself. But that's just not reality. It's fiction for a reason. The reality is none of us can have experienced enough types of scenes. None of us can be educated enough in every possible type of forensic evidence and psychological evidence and procedural mishaps that that may mess things up. And so we have to help one another out. We have to talk to one another. We have to share the resources of our experience, of, of our expertise, and of just our vision of things. Nobody is going to see every piece of evidence the same way. And so when we work together, then we're able to bounce ideas off each other. We're able, um, you know, I like to say, as as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. You get people of good 
caliber like you did with John and Mike and Gray, and you just throw things out there and you start talking about them and you don't worry about, you know, people's feelings and protecting their, their pet ideas and whatever. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what any of us think or who quote unquote wins the game by figuring something out. It's about the surviving family members that want to know. It's about a mom who needs to be able to put to rest and, and know that she did everything she possibly could for her baby and her grandbabies. It's about a community that has suffered a loss and potentially has one or more people among them that were not held accountable for something. This impacts a significant number of people. And, you know, we owe no less than our best to try to figure this out for Katie, for River, for Aiden, and for everyone that knew them, loved them, or lived where they lived. A very special thanks to Danielle Birch, who has headed my forensic group in Patreon, spending hours to get answers. To Lori Morrison from The Unlovely Truth, who has helped me on many occasions with the podcast, breaking down investigations, what should happen, what didn't happen, and the inconsistencies. I couldn't have done this episode without Lori. And thank you, as always, to John Lorden, Gray Hughes, and Mike Morford. I appreciate the time and the research that you have done on this case. From the bottom of my heart, I'm so grateful to you all. If you have any information you want to share on the podcast regarding the deaths of Katie, River, or Aiden, email tips at SheilaWysocki.com or call 1-888-599-0008. Join Patreon and crowdsource justice with private investigator Sheila Wysocki. If you or someone you know is dealing with suicidal ideation or is actively thinking about taking their life, please call the National Suicide Hotline at one 800 273-8255. Without Warning Podcast, Season 3 Investigation, Derailed. Executive Director, Executive Producer, and Host, Sheila Wysocki. And Announcer, Tim Evans. Thank you to Lori Morrison of the podcast, The Unlovely Truth. Thank you to Danielle Birch, Chelsea Sarkowskis, and Private Investigator Jenny Moore for their boots-to-the-ground, passionate, laser-focused research. 